Welcome to chapter four. In this chapter, we're going to talk about cells. Now, you've already seen some cells in the lab. Uh, if you remember, you've seen elodea cells and onion cells and your own uh, epithelial cells from your inside of your cheek. But uh, we're, now we're going to get some more details about structures we see within the cells. So let's start with a little bit of history first here. Uh, the first person that actually recorded seeing cells uh, was this gentleman right here. His name was Robert Hooke. And uh, he's first to describe cells in 1665. Um, he actually uh, looked at shavings from a cork, and you can see here's a, actually a copy of Hook's drawing showing uh, the cork. His big conclusion, oops, there's my dog hacking up a hairball. I think I'll wait for a second. Anyway, here's a, here's a picture of, of, uh, of the cells that, that Hook drew. This is a shaving from a cork, and, um, and you'll notice that he's, he saw these little compartments and they reminded him of the rooms that monks live in called cells, so he called them cells. And his big conclusion was that the reason cork floats is because these little pockets actually contain uh, air. Now, what Hook didn't realize at the time was that what he was really looking at were dead cells, and all he was seeing were the uh, cellulose cell walls uh, of cork. Anyway, Robert Hook gets credit because he's the first guy to write it down. Uh, the next guy in our little uh, litany here is Anton van Leeuwenhoek, or Leeuwenhoek. And he was the first man to, dis to describe living cells, and he, he wrote that he discovered wondrous animacules and wee beasties in a drop of pond water. Um, he looked at all kinds of things, scraping from his teeth, um, pond water, uh, even human sperm. I'll let you figure that one out. Um, anyway, uh, he made his own microscopes, which is kind of cool, and here's actually uh, one of his actual microscopes. These guys were, were quite extraordinary in the fact that they had a single lens which he actually uh, hand ground and uh, this single lens could actually uh, magnify up to 300 times and he created a little uh, focusing gizmo here if you look at this you can see this screw right here would actually move the specimen up or down in the field of view and then uh, this guy right here the one down here would actually move it back and forth so he could focus on it and his specimens were mounted on this tiny little pin so um, this was a uh, von Leeuwenhoek which is uh, actually quite remarkable the work that he did here now we're going to skip ahead about uh, 150 years to these two gentlemen, uh, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, or actually Schleiden and Schwann. And uh, uh, Schleiden was the first guy to actually publish a paper uh, that stated that all plants are made out of cells. Uh, what's interesting was, uh, even though this is pretty obvious to us today, it wasn't that obvious back then. And then the following year, Theodor Schwann uh, published a paper in which he stated that all animals are made of cells. I always imagine these two guys knew each other and that uh, they were like rivals or something. And so Schleiden publishes the paper and says, hey, all animals, all plants are made of cells. And then Schwann comes out a year later and says, well, in that case, all animals are made of cells. I don't know if that's true, but it, it's always kind of fun to think about. Uh, you take all these discoveries together, you end up with what's known as the modern cell theory. Um, and the modern cell theory, as you can see, has three parts. That, number one, the cell is the basic unit of structure and function for all living things, which is essentially the definition of a cell. Uh, number two, that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Um, this would be uh, Schleiden and Schwann and other people because they only looked at plants and animals. Of course, you still have fungi and bacteria and proteist. And then uh, number three is that under modern conditions, all cells arise from pre-existing cells. This is known as the biogenetic law. Um, and even though it does ex explain where new cells come from, it doesn't explain where the very first cell came from. And, of course, uh, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good question. All right, so uh, there are limits to uh, how large cells can be. Uh, generally, cells, as you can see here, are going to be t between 10 and 100 microns. Remember, a micron is one one-thousandth of a millimeter. Uh, and cells are going to be limited because of their surface area to volume. Now, now here's how this works. Uh, cells, and, and here I've drawn some replicas of cells, and we'll make these nice cuboidal cells here. Cells, all the guts that are inside the cell, the stuff that gets into the cell and the stuff that gets out of the cell has to go through the cell wall or cell, mem sorry, cell membrane. Uh, and so uh, you can see essentially the outside of the cell becomes a doorway into the cell. And so if you look at this first cell, which I've simply specified as being two units deep by two units tall by two units wide, if we calculated the surface area available for, for stuff to enter the cell, then we end up with, a, with 24 units squared. If we calculated the total volume here, we end up with eight units cubed. Um, and if we then look at the surface area volume uh, surface area to volume ratio, in other words, how much surface area is available to service every single unit of volume, we find that you get a 3 to 1 ratio of 3 units of surface area to every unit of volume. Now, if I, if I take that cell and actually decrease it in size by half, 
in other words, make it one unit by one unit by one unit, you can see my surface area goes to six units squared and my volume goes to one unit squared, which means the smaller square actually has six units of surface area for every one unit of volume. So, so basically what happens is the smaller the cell is, the easier it is for stuff to get inside the cell. And where this becomes a limit is if you go from small cells and your, your cells start getting larger and larger and larger. Because at some point, there's not enough surface area to actually let all the good stuff in and get all the bad stuff out of the cells uh, for them to survive. And so this is why there are actually no uh, unicellular elephants. Uh, there are ways to cheat, though, and cells do this all the time. One thing is that a cell can maximize its surface area by being really long and thin. And you can see here's a picture I stole off the Internet from the University College of London, and these are actually nerve cells or neurons. And you can see these little squiggle guys here. These are all the neurons. So by being really, really long and skinny, uh, you get maximum surface area per volume. The other thing that you can do, a cell can do, is, is it can be highly folded. And if you recall, uh, when we were germinating some plant seeds, we saw these little root hairs which increase surface area, and, and the same thing happens here. It's a photo from uh, Vanderbilt University. We can see the microvilli folds of, the, of an intestinal cell. This is probably from a rat. Um, but anyway, you can see that this, the, the cell itself is, is really folded up here which, because this is where absorption of nutrients is going to occur. And this allows cells to be, to be larger than you would expect. Um, now we're going to get into some details and, and about cells. And, and this is, in general, what an animal cell will look like. There's a lot of stuff here. But I just want you to look at this picture for just a second, and, and if you'll notice, what, what you'll see is you'll see a bunch of compartments. Uh, now, we've already talked about this uh, in a previous chapter, but the membrane right here is actually that double-layer membrane, uh, double the bilayer of phospholipids. But all these other little membranes inside the cells are, too, and you can see that we've got all kinds of little doogies in here that, uh, that are separated by compartments. So in a typical animal cell, um, and you'll find in a minute this is called a eukaryotic animal cell, you see all kinds of, of compartments. Uh, you probably will notice right off that you've got this, this big spherical structure here, which of course is, is the nucleus. Now let's compare that to a, a typical uh, eukaryotic, eukaryotic plant cell, and uh, what you'll notice is we still have the compartments. Matter of fact, a lot of the same structures, you, nucleus, uh, these gizmos here, that guy there, now, even this little red guy here of mitochondrion, but you'll notice that now we have chloroplasts. And again, recall, you've already seen chloroplasts with a microscope in LODF. But, but the big deal is here that these types of cells actually are highly compartmentalized, and that allows them to carry on different functions in different parts of the cell. So uh, instead of getting into the details here, we just want to get you started on uh, what the, the, some of the history of cell theory. And um, the next uh, screencast will actually talk about different structures within the cells, which are called organelles. Okay. So uh, for now, that's it.